Good morning. You will notice that we're all like, you know, Sylvia's not here, Roger's not here, and my dad's back there, and now Roger's gone back there too. So there's a few of us not here this morning. So we're all filling in, doing some things. I'm doing some things over there that I've never done before. But anyways, our fingers are crossed, and we're hoping and trusting that things will go as we have planned and uh, practiced and rehearsed. So welcome to you all for our service to take today. There's just a couple of announcements. I'm not sh sure if there's any that's coming up on the screen. Dad? Um, yeah, so anyways, I'll, I'll let those just go through. Just to remind you that the breakfast, men's breakfast, is on Saturday morning at 8.30. I think that's the last one for the year, as boohoo, mom and dad are leaving to go to Newfoundland for a couple of months in, um, yeah, as happy as I am for them. I'm sad for me. Um, and then the other thing, next weekend, um, Majors Brad and Sue will still be away, and actually mom and dad will be doing the service. Um, and it is next weekend on the Sunday that I saw in the bulletin, the jars, if any of you still have your jars for partners admission, next Sunday is the Sunday to get those in as we will be uh, um, collecting those and the deadline for that is Sunday, May 26. So I think that's all in our regular things on this week for Tuesday night and whatnot. Don't forget if you want tickets for the teddy bear picnic, um, you can see mom or dad after the service. And the marketplace, um, again, all those things are in your bulletin. So um, yeah, have a look at that. If you got it online or if you got a paper copy, it's all in there. And in the meantime, as I said, Majors Brad and Sue are away on vacation. And so for today, we welcome Majors Ken and Bev Smith. So thank you. We are glad to have you and grateful that you have come. Well, good morning, and it's our delight to be here with you today. It's a holiday weekend, and uh, some folks might be away at the cottage or at the beach or, or doing things. It's a beautiful day. I think it's going to be beautiful. The sun's supposed to come out this afternoon, and tomorrow's supposed to be lovely. So we rejoice in all that God has given us and all that he's doing in our lives in these days. And I know that God is going to be with us as we worship him this morning. Uh, our opening song this morning is found in our psalm book. The words are by Isaac Watts, a great hymn writer. The band has already introduced the melody for us. So if you're able, I invite you to stand this morning and we'll sing the first two verses through, please. Sing the mighty power of God Now you'll notice as we sing that these verses have a lot to do with looking around at our world, at nature, at the beauty that we see everywhere around us. God showing himself, revealing himself to us. You're singing well. There's one more verse, so let's sing verse 3 together. There's not a plant or flower below but makes thy Amen. You may be seated. 
conceited. I love those last two lines, everywhere that we can be, thou God art present there. I wonder if any of you were able to witness the northern lights that were spectacular in the last month. Somebody's nodding their head there. I understand it was due to a solar storm and they were worried that it would disrupt uh, some Wi-Fi, but it certainly was a spectacular view of uh, one of God's wonders. How do you distinguish between natural phenomena and supernatural ones? Perhaps back thousands of years ago, something like the northern lights or eclipses the wonders of the world that were unexplained would actually foster and flourish faith in God. Whereas these days, some people uh, find that because it's explainable in scientific terms, it may actually diminish their faith. But in reality, God speaks to us, whether it's a natural or supernatural phenomenon, God speaks to us all around, doesn't he? He knows how weak we are, how insignificant when you think that we're tiny creatures uh, as part of a solar system that surrounds a small star on the edge of a galaxy called the Milky Way in the middle of millions of galaxies. And we know very little the knowledge that we have, although expanding greatly, is one one millionth less even than that of what God knows and what is in his universe. I wish I had time to talk to you about theological views like God of the gaps. God does not become smaller because we find out more about his wonderful universe. And we still discover more and more things that turn us to him and that help us understand how great he is and how small and weak we are, how broken we are, how riddled with sin we are, but yet, but yet, he loves us and he wants to reach out and heal us and save us. And so we turn to our scripture for this morning, found in Psalm 19, Psalm 1-9, the heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim his handiwork. Day after day, they pour forth speech. Night after night, they display knowledge. There is no speech or language where their voice is not heard. Their voice goes out into all the earth. Their words to the end of the world. In the heavens, he has pitched a tent for the sun, which is like a bridegroom coming forth from his pavilion, like a champion rejoicing to run his course. It rises at one end of the heavens and makes its circuit to the other. Nothing is hidden from the sun's heat. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart. The commands of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The ordinances of the Lord are sure and altogether righteous. They are more precious than gold, than much pure gold, sweeter than honey, than honey from the honeycomb. By them is your servant warned. In keeping them there is great reward. Who can discern his own errors? Forgive my hidden faults. Keep your servant also from willful sins. May they not rule over me. Then will I be blameless, innocent of great transgression. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight. O oh Lord, my rock and my redeemer. That, may that be the prayer of all of our hearts today, 
as we join together in worship of this awe-inspiring God. And so we turn to Song 582. What can we do when we realize how broken and sin-riddled we are and how great God is? What can we do except fall at his feet and tell him of our love for him? Father, we love you. Thank you for this opportunity to join together with your saints here at Winterbury Core to praise you, to glorify you, to recognize our place in your universe, although seemingly insignificant, although weak, sometimes in need of healing, sometimes in need of forgiveness, always in need of your salvation yet you love us, and you have sent your son to die for us. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. And as this is Pentecost Sunday, we welcome your spirit here today. And as your spirit makes us one in worship, may we sense again afresh your spirit alive in us, helping us to be the people that you want us to be. Encourage us, strengthen us as we look to your word this morning, as we sing songs about you, as we lift our hearts to you, and prepare us for what lies ahead this week, this year, this decade. We know in this world we will have trouble, but we can overcome the world by the power of your spirit. And we trust you, Lord, this morning. Thank you that you will feed us and you will strengthen us. In Jesus' name, amen. One of the ways that God speaks to us is through his word. And we can stand on that in our lives as we rely upon the Bible and on all the many promises that God has given. And we're going to sing about that in our next song, Standing on the Promises of Christ my King. Through eternal ages let his praises ring. Glory in the highest, I will shout and sing, Standing 
on the promises of God. It's a great song. I think we'll just remain seated for now as we sing it together, and the band is going to help us. We'll sing the first two verses to you, please. Holding on the promises of Christ my King, through eternal ages let his praises ring. Glory in the highest, I will shout and sing, standing on the cross of Christ. Whenever I sing this song, I'm reminded that when I was growing up as a youngster years ago, we used to have a little thing on our tables called a promise box. Have any of you, I see a few nods out there. Some of you know what I'm talking about. And after our meal times, before we prayed, we'd pass it around and we'd each take a little card, a little promise from God's word, and we'd read one of those promises. And that was a real strength to my heart, knowing that we could stand on those promises that God would assure us of his presence with us through all the storms of life. I'm going to invite us to read together this next verse before we sing verses 4 and 5. Let's read together. Standing on the promises of Christ my Lord, bound to him eternally by love's strong cord, overcoming daily with the Spirit's sword, standing on the promises of God. So let's sing now verse 4, standing on the promises I cannot fall, and then verse 5. Standing on the promises I cannot fall, this every moment to the Spirit's call, resting in my Savior as my all in all, standing on the promises of Thank you for that good saying. I understand my comments last week about my mother. Um, <laughs> shocked some people, but I, I hope you realize that I did love her. Even though she was all those things that I said, I did love her very much. Okay. Shall we take the collection? Dear God, we return to you part of what you have given us. We hope that we can use it successfully to bring others to you so that they can feel the joy and the happiness that we have in knowing you and relying on you. Please help us in our daily 
lives to appreciate you and appreciate all you have given us. Amen. Now, what about the word wonder? I wonder what this gentleman said about his mother last week. <laughs> I, I can't say anything about my mother because my mother-in-law is looking at me from there and my other mother's looking at me from there, so I'm daring not to say anything about my mother. But um, if you lose your wonder, you're in trouble. The wonder of children is wonderful to behold. But if you lose your wonder as an adult, usually there's something wrong. It might be simple as exhaustion or depression. It might be illness. It might be cynicism, hardness of heart. But it's telling us something about ourselves when we lose our wonder. And scientists are becoming more and more in awe and in wonder as they discover more things. With the help of AI, I might say, so, uh, even in the medical field, we're using AI to discover new uh, drugs that could be helpful uh, to cure certain illnesses. Uh, certainly in terms of the atomic world and the cosmological world, the world of energy and matter and stars and cosmology, we're discovering new things all the time. And the natural response of scientists is to be in wonder because of the amazing things they are discovering about the creator who created it all. So let's turn to our next song, Oh, the Wonder of It All. Think about the things that make you wonder in our world around us as we sing. There's the wonder of sunset at evening, the wonder of sunrise are seen, but the wonder of wonders that thrills my soul is the wonder that loves me. to 
Now, as I start my message to you this morning, I want to start by asking you a question. Where were you between the hours of 3 and 4 p.m. on Monday, April 8, 2024? Now, this is not a court of law. Don't worry, you haven't done anything wrong. I'm not questioning you like the police or anything, but I'm just asking that question. Anybody can think about it? Some of you are realizing what I'm talking about. I'm seeing the light bulb go on in some of your heads. What if I was to show you this next slide here? Does this bring back any bells? Does this bring back any memories? Now the light dawns for some of you. How many of you were able to look at the solar eclipse on that Monday afternoon a few weeks ago? Some of you? Yeah, I see a few hands raised out there. My wife and I were fortunate to be able to go out into the park just behind our building where we had a pretty good view. There were a number of us standing around on that afternoon and we were amazed at just how dark it got just after three o'clock and it didn't last very long just for a few minutes but we had a pretty good glimpse of the moon being blocked by the sun for those few minutes and I don't think I've ever experienced anything quite like that before. It was a pretty spectacular sight to be sure. I've got to admit that while I was standing there looking up at the sky on that Monday afternoon, my mind was drawn to these very verses that my wife read for us earlier in our meeting this morning from Psalm 19. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. In fact, I remember thinking and even saying that verse to myself, looking up into that sky when it was so dark on that afternoon. Well, in keeping with that verse, I've entitled my message to you today, It's Written in the Stars. We'll have the next slide, please. It's Written in the Stars. Now, although that title may have been come from that verse and been inspired by that psalm during that solar eclipse, if we really take a look at this psalm, Psalm 19 in our Bibles, if we look at it in its entirety, we discover it's not really so much about the stars, that's a part of it, the night sky, but it's really about communication. God communicating with us and us communicating with God. And that's what I want to really focus our thoughts on for a few moments this morning. Why? Because it's written in the stars. We all know that the communications industry has grown by leaps and bounds in our generation, hasn't it? Historians tell us that we're actually living in the biggest societal change our world has seen since the Industrial Revolution. The information age, as it's called, spawned by the advent of the internet and everything that goes with it, has simply revolutionized the way that we communicate. The way we get our information, the way we do business, even the way we socialize and talk to each other, hasn't it? It has made our world smaller in so many ways. You know, when my wife and I were first dating, her parents, who were longtime Salvation Army officers, were serving on the mission field in Africa, in Kenya. And their only means of staying in touch was through airmail letters that would often take a couple of weeks to reach Canada. So by the time you got it, the news was already old. Once a month, they might make a phone call uh, to their family back home in Canada, but the connection wasn't always stable and there was often crackling on the line and sometimes you'd have to shout to be heard. Well, that was back in the 1970s and early 80s. Now, more than 40 years later, you can send a text message to somebody or even on the other side of the world and they will get it instantly just like that. Not only that, but depending on the time zone and if they're awake, they'll often respond to you right away. Isn't that amazing? What technology has done in our lifetimes, in our generation, with the use of FaceTime or Facebook Messenger, you can not only do that, but you can talk to your loved ones from far away at any time of day or night, and you can even see them face to face. I find that amazing. Boy, when I was growing up, that was like something we saw in our Saturday morning cartoons, like the Jetsons or something. And I'm thinking, that's the space age. But folks, we're doing it now, aren't we? That's how far we've come. Today, even my own grandchildren, who are six and five, are growing up and taking all of this for granted. That's just simply the world that they're growing up in now. They don't think anything about looking at their phones and communicating with grandma and grandpa or other people. 
That's just the world in which we now live. Well, communicating with other people, whether it's for business or pleasure, has become an important part of our lives. Yet this psalm that we're going to look at today, Psalm 19, written some 3,000 years ago by a young shepherd boy, David, as he was looking up at the night skies, speaks to both us about how God communicates with us. If you have your Bibles this morning, and some of you might have your Bibles, or you can look it up on your phone as well. That's the age that we live in now, isn't it? You can follow along as we look at it together. We're going to see just how this psalm speaks to us about the most important kind of communication there is, that between Almighty God and ordinary human beings like ourselves. We often use the word revelation to describe how God communicates to us in this way. Creation, in fact, bears witness to God's revealing of himself to us. His creatures, in turn, reflect what God is like, much as an antenna reflects the beam of a radio transmitter or the moon reflects the light of the sun. But what does communication between God and his creation have to do with you and me? And how can we discover what God is trying to say to us? Well, Psalm 19 answers that question by presenting what we might call three witnesses. Here we go, the witness of nature, the witness of God's word, and the witness of God's servant. Look at the first six verses of this psalm. Here David is presenting the witness of God through nature. This in one way, an important way in which God communicates with us. We see how God is revealing himself to us through everything he has created, the heavens, the skies, the night, the day, all send out a message. They speak about God's glory. They announce God's reputation. The psalmist starts out with this stunning declaration. Here it is, the heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day they pour forth speech. Night after night they reveal knowledge. What's the psalmist saying? The heavens, in all their expanse, announce God's ability as creator. David tell us, tells us that the galaxies actually speak to us. They proclaim God as the creator and sustainer of the whole universe. They are, in essence, a mirror image of God himself. The orderliness and perfection of the solar system becomes a school where we learn something about God's character. They demonstrate that God is a God of intricate design a God who organized the universe in accordance with a master plan. It didn't just evolve at random, as some of people would have us believe. All creation, in fact, tells us of a God of beauty who delights in harmony, color, and form, and who had a plan, and who created the universe at his word. Now, the word for man in the Greek language, in which much of the Bible, especially the New Testament, is written, is the word anthropos, from which we get the word anthropology. In describing our human race, it literally means the up-looking one. Now, since the beginning of time, men and women have often stood gazing into the clear night sky, looking up at the stars. The evidence of the thousands of people who did just that was evident in people looking up at that solar eclipse a few weeks ago, and I found I, I had to crane my neck to look high up in the sky in order to see it. And my wife also referred to the northern lights that some of us saw earlier this week as well. You see, God intended for us to look up at the heavens, to look up at the sky, to look up at the stars, to consider his creation. That's one thing, you know, that separates us from the animals. Did you know that? Think about it. A dog looks down. A cow looks down. A horse looks down. But men and women were created by God to look up and see God, their creator. The heavens eloquently announce that God is alive, that he is well and active. Now, of course, communication has two parts, doesn't it? Just as a message is sent, so it must be properly received in order for true communication to take place. And while the heavens constantly tell the glory of God, not everyone receives the message. As with radio and television, a transmitter without a receiver is useless. 
God is continually sending out his message of mercy, peace, love, and forgiveness. But a person will not always be aware of it unless they have tuned in. David tuned in to God's revelation, and he heard the eloquence of nature's witness. Looking up to the heavens, to the skies, if you will, he wrote in verse 2 that day after day they pour forth speech, night after night they reveal knowledge. Look at what he says in verses 3 and 4. Next slide here, please. They have no speech, they use no words, no sound is heard from them, yet their voice goes out into all the earth, their words to the ends of the world. In other words, the evidence of God is everywhere. No wonder that mankind has always been so religious. Throughout the eons of time, men and women have always known instinctively that they have been spoken to. The Bible says that God's voice is heard throughout all the earth, even to the ends of the world. That's why the Apostle Paul can write in Romans 1 verse 20, Since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that people, he says, are without excuse. There is no place in the universe one can go without confronting this witness. Yes, it's written in the stars, we might say, but it's also seen in every aspect of creation. And it's true, when we look around at the beauty of our world, we can hear the testimony of nature and see in it the revelation of God, our creator. As John Wesley once put it, he said, the world around us is a mighty volume wherewith God has declared himself. Too many people try to explain the mysteries of the universe using our own humanistic, scientific, or philosophic terminology. Yet how can you deny the existence of God when you look at the beauty that surrounds us day after day? How can you deny the existence of God when you look at the millions of stars in the night sky? Even if we know nothing else about God, we can acknowledge that he exists and that his handiwork can be seen in all creation. The songwriter put it this way, O oh Lord my God, when I in awesome wonder, we'll have the next slide please, when I consider all the worlds thy hands have made, I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder, thy power throughout the universe displayed. And what's the chorus of that song? Next slide. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. We look around at all the worlds, everything that God has made, and we know that God is our creator, and we sing to him how great thou art. Truly we serve a great God, and the evidence of his greatness surrounds us day and night. But in the second portion of this psalm, as David continues to reflect on how God communicates with us, he moves from the witness of creation to the witness of God's word. Next slide, please. David refers to the books of the law, which you've got to remember in his day, that was all the only Bible they had, the books of Moses. The rest of the Old Testament really hadn't been written yet to that point in time. That was what he knew. So he talks about the books of the law, but really he's talking about God's word, Holy Scripture. God's law that David spoke about consists of his moral commands, which in turn are founded on God's moral nature. They are the principles or standards that he has set in place for all humankind to follow if they want to obey him. Now as we go through this psalm, and you'll see that if you have it open in front of you there, we note that David's praise for the law of God, or, or the word of God, we can say, actually exceeds his praise for nature. Now many skeptics in our world today ask, why do we even need the Bible? Why do we need this special revelation? And sadly, many never even read it. Even for many Christians, their Bibles often lay gathering dust on their shelves. The state of biblical literacy in our world today is lower than it's ever been. 
at least here in our Western society. Yet, God's Word, the Bible, is so important. It's something precious. It's something we all need in our lives. The book of Genesis tells how Adam and Eve lost their moral innocence by disobeying God. In theological terms, we speak of that as the fall. And here's the thing. Their disobedience clouded their vision of what was right and what was wrong. Their eyes became darkened and their hearing dulled. In some ways, they became insensitive to the witness of nature. They needed the witness of God's written revelation, God's law, to restore their awareness. Now, while it is true that people can become aware of God in a general sort of way by observing his work and creation, we can only get to know God personally and specifically by reading his word and becoming aware of him through the written revelation he has given us through himself. In this way, we can discover more about the God who loves us, the God who cares for us, the God who forgives us, and who redeems his people. The witness of nature is great, but we need to explicitly hear the witness of God's word as well. So let's look again at our text. Look at verses 7 to 9 and note the various ways in which David describes it. We'll have the next slide, please. What does he say? The law of the Lord is perfect, refreshing the soul. The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart. When we are down, we can have joy as we look to God's word. The commands of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The decrees of the Lord are firm, and all of them are righteous. And we could add to that perhaps this morning, the promises of God, as we were singing about, are wonderful that we can share and delight in to affirm our souls and to confirm God at work in our lives. In these verses from Psalm 19, not only is the word of God, of God's holy scripture described, but we are specifically told all these things that it does for us. Isn't that amazing? It is perfect. That means that it's without spot or blemish, just like the ancient temporal sacrifices were told they had to be perfect to be brought before the Lord. Contrary to God, contrary to man-made laws that we deal with that are put in place by our governments and people, God's laws are perfect, says the psalmist. They are trustworthy. They are reliable. They are the foundation for all that is right and just, the basis of all truth in our world. Do you believe that? Look at what God's word does. It revives our souls. It converts us from our old sinful ways and leads us in the way everlasting. It gives wisdom to those who are slow in understanding. It gives joy to the heart and light to the eyes. The eyes representing the mind, of course, which by keeping God's law we can keep pure and clean for him. And then finally, he says, God's law or God's word endures forever. As Jesus also said in Matthew 24, 35, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. Now, how many of you here still, still read the newspaper? I've got to confess, like many others in our modern generation, I, I don't get a newspaper anymore. I prefer now to get my news either online through social media or on radio or TV, such is our modern age that we live in. I know many magazine and newspaper publishers are actually worried about the future of their industry as a result. Well, be that as it may, we live in a world where we are bombarded daily with news headlines that are downright depressing, if not scary. Do you ever feel that way when watching the nightly news or hearing about it? whether it's the latest gun violence in our own cities or south of the border, or descriptions of war, earthquakes, famines, humanitarian crises of every kind all around the world. It gets to the point where I'm almost afraid to turn the news on anymore. I want to shut it off. It's too depressing. I can't take it. 
It's a never-ending cycle that just goes on and on. And I think to myself, when will it ever end? What a contrast to the good news reflected in the Word of God. This unique revelation that tells us so much more about God, but also about ourselves as well when you think about it. David sums it up in verse 10 where he describes it as being more precious than gold, sweeter than honey. In other words, better than the finest things that life has to offer is the precious word of God that we rely on. So thirdly, as David considers the witnesses of nature and of God's written word, he is overwhelmed by his own sinfulness because he finds that the finger points right back at him. This brings us to the third witness. Next slide, please. The witness of God's servant, which is how David refers to himself. God's servant, he says. This is where the application comes. This is where it becomes personal, folks, as each of us reading this psalm can apply it to our own lives. Sensing his own need for cleansing, what does David say? Look at verses 12 and 13. Next slide. He says, Forgive my hidden faults. Keep your servant also from willful sins. May they not rule over me, he says. Then I will be blameless, innocent of great transgression. You see, the more David discovered about God through nature, and the more he discovered about God through looking at the scriptures, the more he discovered about himself and how he wasn't measuring up to all that God would have him to be. The goal of David's confession was that he might be blameless, he says, just like the other witnesses in this psalm. In the closing verse, what does he say? Next slide, please. He says, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Surely that's a prayer that should be constantly on all our lips and in all our hearts, is it not? You see, David wanted to participate personally in this hymn of praise. Like the night skies of the heavens, he wanted to proclaim the glory of God. And David also knew that the law of God, God's holy written revelation in the scriptures, and he knew that when he read that, he wanted to be altogether righteous in everything he was and everything that he did. He was aware of these things witnesses of nature and of God's word, but ultimately David wanted his own life to have his own witness, to be his own witness to the God of love in his heart who created him, who redeemed him, who forgave his sins. Well, let's go to the next slide again here. We started off by saying that the theme of this psalm is communication. The most important kind of communication there is between Almighty God and ordinary human beings like ourselves. God speaks to us in different ways. Through the beauty of his creation, yes, the heavens declare the glory of God. Through his word, what does he say? The law of the Lord is perfect. And God expects us, in turn, to respond to receive the message, and to respond. But here's the message I want to take you to take from this psalm here this morning, our final slide. God has communicated with us. Are we communicating with him? God speaks to us through nature, yes, and through his word, but are we hearing what he has to say? Are we engaged in an ongoing daily conversation with the Almighty, listening for his voice, responding within our own hearts by how we live our lives, the words we say, the things we do? Like the psalmist David, perhaps you too have looked up and seen the beauties of creation and acknowledged God's presence in a general kind of way and say, yes, Lord, I, I know you exist. I know there's a God. A lot of people believe that and say, yes, I believe there's a God. But it needs to go beyond that. 
Perhaps you've read the Bible and seen how your own life doesn't in fact measure up to the standards laid down in God's word. But just as God reached out to us, are you ready to reach out to him? Communication is a two-way street. Are you willing to bow before him in prayer this morning and confess your own weaknesses, your own faults and failures, and find new strength in him to meet your every need? Many of us have done that. But I find in my own life it's something I need to do every day. Every morning when I wake up, I need to say once again, God, thank you for this day. Help me to live it for you. Use me, Lord. Well, may God help each of us to respond in our own way as we bow before him in prayer together. Pray with me. God Almighty, King of the universe, we acknowledge you today. Lord, you have written your love in the heavens. We see your handiwork every time we look around at the beauty of our world or up into the night sky. We read your word, God, and hear you speaking to our own hearts. Lord, I pray you would help us to respond to you as did David of old, to say, yes, Lord, I want to live each day in relationship with you. Bless us now as we wait upon you, we pray in Jesus' name. As we reflect upon our message this morning and to help us to respond in our own hearts, I want us to sing an old chorus written to familiar melody. The words simply say this, If on my soul a trace of sin remaineth, if on my hands a stain may yet be seen, if one dark thought a wearied mind retaineth, oh, wash me, Lord, oh, wash me, till every part be clean. For I would live that men may see thyself in me, I would in faith ascend thy holy hill, and with my thoughts, in tune with you, in tune with your divinity, would learn how best to do thy holy will. Is that your prayer this morning? Make it your prayer. We're going to sing the chorus too, perhaps a couple of times together, and make this your time to respond in your own hearts as we sing. If on my soul a trace of sin remaineth, if on my hands a stain may yet be seen, if one dark thought a wearied mind retaineth. Oh, wash me, Lord. For I would live, for I would live that men may see myself. I would in faith ascend my holy hill. And with my thoughts in tune with thy divinity Would learn how best to do thy home The psalmist David said, May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight. Is that your prayer? To have every thought, everything you say, everything you do, to be in tune with God's will. Let's sing the chorus once more. If on my soul a trace of sin remaineth, if on my hands a stain yet be seen, if one dark thought a wearied mind retaineth, O oh, wash me, Lord, and clean. For I would live that men may see thyself in me. I would in faith ascend thy holy hill, and with my thoughts in tune with thy divinity, would learn how best 
to do thy holy. Amen. Amen. May that prayer be echoed in each of our hearts today. Now, to conclude our meeting this morning, we're going to turn, in fact, to the song that I mentioned in my sermon a few moments ago, and the band is going to help us as we sing. The story goes that it was the summer of 1885, and Swedish author Carl Boberg was out walking, out in a field, out in a thunderstorm, and afterwards a rainbow appeared, and, and from his home he could hear church bells ringing and listen to the birds singing in a nearby woods and see the stillness of an ancient inlet, all of which inspired him to pen these words. Now, at first, his original poem, this is interesting, I found, entitled, Oh Great God, it didn't really catch on until someone set it to music. They found a traditional Swedish folk song melody, and they put it with the words, and from there, the song went all across the world. It was translated into Russian and then into English, where it was heard in the country of India by an American evangelist by the name of Edwin Orr. He brought it back to the States, and then it was picked up in the 1950s by singer George Beverly Shea. Some of you might remember who used to sing it in the Billy Graham Crusades in the 1950s and 60s. And this beautiful song that we now love. Did you know that this song, in fact, continues to be listed as one of the greatest hymns ever written. Usually it's number two behind Amazing Grace, which people like. But it's a beautiful song. I love how it speaks about God in nature and God redeeming us. So I'm going to invite you, if you're able, to stand with us. The band is going to help us, and we're going to sing verses one and two, please. You know, I'm always moved when I come to this third verse, a verse that talks about Jesus coming into the world for our sins. And when I think how God, his son not sparing, sent him to die, I scarce can take it in. That on the cross, my burdens gladly bearing, he bled and died to take away my sins really thought about it? Jesus dying on the cross for your sins here this morning. We're going to sing the last verse together, when Christ shall come with shouts of acclamation. Let's lift it up on verse 4 together. When Christ shall come with 
Amen. Thank you for that good sing and for participating this morning. I trust the Lord has blessed you in your heart. Following our closing prayer, we're going to sing, O Father, let thy love remain as our united benediction. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for your presence here with us this morning. With the psalmist, we look around at the beauty of nature, your handiwork in the skies above. We echo the words of that song, Lord, we were just singing, how great thou art. How marvelous, Lord, that you choose to communicate with us, to have a relationship with us, to lead us in the paths of righteousness as we walk with you. As we depart from here today, go with us now into this coming week. Bless us, Lord, empower us by your Spirit to be your witnesses in the world. And we will give you all the glory and all the honor and all the praise. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. O Father, let thy love remain.